I love to worship the Lord, don't you? I love to worship the Lord. He's so good. We use words in church sometimes we don't use every day, and we use a word called redeemed. And I used to say this about being redeemed. I don't know how old you are. This will state my age real fast, but I remember years ago, you've heard me say this before, but I, some of you have, but I, I remember uh, postage, I mean, not, not, but s &H green stamps. Anybody remember those? How many old enough to remember S&H green stamps? You remember those? You remember they had S&H green stamp stores? So for all of you young folks who have no clue what that is, when you would buy groceries, they would give you stamps. When you would buy sometimes fuel, they'd give you stamps. And you'd take these stamps and lick them and stick them in a book. And when you filled the book up, you could collect books. And when you got so many books, you could go down and they called it redeem them redeem them for an item like a sewing machine a coffee pot whatever you could afford and how many books you had so essentially you took a piece of paper with some adhesive on the back of it and some worthless print on it had no value whatsoever and you licked and you put your own spit on it and that gave it no more value than it had before and you stuck it in a book and you took it down, this worthless piece of adhesive and cardboard it was stuck to into a store, and you traded nothing, something that was worth nothing for something that you would usually have to use money to buy with. When the Lord redeemed us, <laughs> He took something that was worthless and useless and he put value on it because of the blood of his son. And that's why we sing, I'm redeemed by love divine. I thank you, Lord, that I'm redeemed. Come on, church, thank you that you're redeemed.
me sing that. Come on, say redeem. redeem so Come on, do it a couple more times. Say redeem. redeem so One more time. Come on, sing redeem. redeem so All right, Lord, come on, sing.
Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. I praise you.
see if I know this verse. Pardon, sing with me. For sin and a peace that endureth thine own spirit.
and lightning that strikes God of the earth, God of the seas, God of in heaven loves me. Yes, he does. God is in the house. Amen. Can we just praise him one more time from the abundance of our heart? Come on, not some token praise, real praise. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you, God, that your presence is in the house. We love you, we love you, we love you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Father, if you're concerned about when a sparrow falls, how much more that you're concerned about us in this sanctuary today. Father, we thank you that you desire to inhabit the praises of your people. Father, that means when we take just a few moments to sacrifice. Lord, if we'll lift up the sacrifice of praise, your word tells us that your presence of an almighty God literally comes and takes up residence inside of us. And Father, we thank you for those promises that are true, and amen, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated this morning. Give him one more praise offering, if you would. Amen. We are glad that you are with us at Brownsville Assembly of God Church this morning. Truly the greatest church in all the land. And we are so thankful that God's presence is here with us today, too. I mean, know the Spirit of the Lord, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty and freedom. We can come into the house of God this morning. We don't have to worry about anything. How many know you can enjoy the freedom in the presence of the Lord? Amen. Hallelujah. Just a quick announcement before we take our morning tithes and offerings, and that is that we are having a leadership meeting after the service today over across the street in the youth auditorium. We want to invite all those who would be interested in taking part in any of the leadership of the youth church here at Hearts Ablaze. Hearts Ablaze is the student ministry, so whether you're a sophomore in high school or a junior in college, you're a student. I'm Pastor Michael Rowan. For many of you that may not know, I think most of you do. I'm the one cracking jokes every Sunday, but uh, we are uh, interested in all those who would be willing to say, I want to step up during my time here at uh, BRSM, and uh, we're going to serve everybody firehouse subs today. Firehouse subs will be at the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. I'm convinced of that. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful sandwich at Firehouse. It's the only fire I want to get close to other than Revival Fire, but uh, I... Uh, we, in we invite all of you over there, all the students that say, I'd like to be either an under-shepherd or an intern or involved in leadership in any way in Hearts of Blaze Youth Church. You can head over there across the street today for a meeting, and I know that the Lord will richly bless you. I heard a story a few days ago. I want to tell it to you as we prepare to take our morning tithe and offering. I was reading in a book, and um, the story was told of a, a young boy who went into an ice cream shop, and he was wanting to buy some ice cream. And, he had just a little bit of change in his hand. He walked up to the lady running the store, and he said, Ma'am, I would like to have some vanilla ice cream because vanilla ice cream is my favorite. He said, but even more than that, he said, I would really love to have some sprinkles on it because that's really my ultimate favorite. And she said, all right. He said, well, before you scoop that out, ma'am, could you tell me how much the ice cream with the sprinkles is? And she says, well, son, that's 50 cents. We know this is an old story. Amen. And he said, 50 cents. She said, yes, sir. One scoop of ice cream with sprinkles is 50 cents. And he said, well, and he looked down at his hand and he looked up at her and he looked back down at his hand. Finally, he looked at her and he said, well, how much is just vanilla ice cream with no sprinkles? And she said, well, son, that's 35 cents. And he looked down at his hand and he looked up and he said, I'll have a, just a plain scoop of vanilla ice cream. And she said, well, I thought sprinkles were your favorite. He said, but... Well, it is, but today I'm going to have just a plain scoop of vanilla ice cream. And so she scooped it up for him and gave it to him in a little dish. And he sat there and uh, just very calmly and collectively ate his little scoop of ice cream. After it was all said and done, he walked up and tapped her on the shoulder and said, Ma'am, thank you very much. You scoop ice cream better than anybody I've ever met before. And uh, he uh, hugged her on the neck and said, Thank you. And he went on his way. And the waitress was shocked to find that as she went over to the table, there was... 
the empty cup of ice cream with 15 cents laying next to it. Of course, the tip. And I thought to myself, if a young boy in an ice cream shop is mindful enough to give someone scooping him some ice cream her due, should we give God his? You know, we hear the story. That was, I'm going to say that again. Shouldn't we give God his? Amen. How many know that you've been blessed abundantly, abundantly by the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, we hear all the time from waiters and waitresses around America that people in church are not good tippers. I hear it all the time. Let me tell you something, friends. I get ticked off when I go to a restaurant and I see church folks that will slip a track down and no tip. Let me tell you something. You have no right to be ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ if you're a cheapskate. I want to tell you, oh, I, let me preach for just a moment. Now I'm preaching to myself because just a few months ago I went somewhere, and I always leave a good tip, but if anyone ever knows I'm in church or a minister, I leave a great tip. <laughs> and I thought to myself, shouldn't I leave a great tip all the time? But I always leave a good tip, but I always love to bless people. And I was in a restaurant, and I was talking to a, uh, a waiter, and he was telling me this and that and the other. And I just really felt compelled uh, to give him a, a good tip. Not a great tip, a good tip. See, I'm preaching to myself. And so uh, we were sitting there. Well, he asked about this and that and the other. And he said, well, uh, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a minister. And uh, he said, really? I said, yeah, I'm a preacher. And I said, I'm a pastor on staff over at Brownsville. I said, I got to talk and so forth. Then I thought, man, <laughs> you know, he knows I'm a pastor. <laughs> he knows where I go to church. And so I told Holly, I said, I really want to bless this guy. And so uh, I left him $100, $100 tip. My meal was like $20. I left him 100 bucks. And uh, I have seen him actually a couple times since then. And he said, Pastor, you, you don't understand. He said, nobody ever does that. He said, we see church folks coming in. And he said, we just kind of cringe. He said, we kind of cringe. I think that people ought to say, man, here comes church folks. Hallelujah. If they work in a restaurant. Here's the point. I'm not going to get a whole lot of amens, but I'm going to preach it anyway. <laughs> Afterwards, not necessarily did I feel convicted, but I thought to myself, I wanted to make sure that this man didn't think bad of me. I wanted him to know because I'm a man of God, a minister of the gospel, I'm blessed. I want him to be blessed. But you know what? We should feel the same way about God. We want God to think well of us. Amen. Here's a, a man that's working, uh, serving food to folks, trying to make a living. I want to make sure he, he didn't think bad of me. And so I want to give him a great tip. Let me give you a tip today. I want God to think good of you. See, God's already here in the house. How many know he's omniscient? He knows. He's no fool. He's a personality. He knows what's in this place right now. He knows what's in your heart right now. He knows what's in your VCR. He knows what's behind closed doors. He knows what's talked about behind closed doors. He knows. And he knows how much you make. He knows what you give your money to. And I think it's amazing how we can go in and we can tip or not tip or really tip. And then we come to the house of God after all the blessings that we have received. And, and we get and we get and we give. This is our opportunity to give, friends. Because let me tell you something. We've just come through the summer months. And there's no church that I'm aware of of any denomination in America anywhere that can brag about the finances that come in in the summer. Now we're closing out the summer. We are uh, obviously thrilled that the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry is in the house and on the campus. But we're having to make a lot of adjustments and play a little catch up. I'm asking all of you today, since God knows that you're a Christian and he knows that you're in church, don't give him a good tip because he already knows who you are. Give him something great. Give him an abundance. I have been all over the world, and there is a little lady in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Her name is Sally Kirka. She's 80-some-odd years old, red hair. She can't even hardly stand and walk on her own. She supports Michael Rowan Ministries each and every month. I can go out to my mailbox, Pastor, on any given month, and I'm telling you, I can set my watch to it. I can open up that mailbox. There'll be a little letter from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She'll have chicken scratch, Pastor Richard. It literally can't even hardly make it out. She 
has got arthritis and she I've seen her write them out to me when I was standing next to her she'll just scribble out twenty dollars and she's come to me over and over and over and said Pastor Rowan I know it's not much and I know you go all over the world and but it's my gift to you and I said Sally you will never know and I was in Pittsburgh last year it was in a crowd of people and I was taking up an offering and I said you know what there are people that are faithful to give to me I said Sally Kirk I said twenty dollars every month and she tears just streaming down her face and I said Sally you'll never know you'll never know what your gift has meant to me in my ministry lives have been changed because of a little old lady scribbling out a twenty dollar check and that's just to Michael Rowan who am I I'm just thankful that God lets me have the ability to stand up here today and do anything for him at all but we're talking about the omniscient omnipotent omnipresent ruler of the universe you have an opportunity today to give out of the abundance that he's already given you and say God wham what do you think about that to your brother Lord, I don't want to just give you a little bit. I want you to, well, I want to walk out of this house today and God coming up to clean up the auditorium and say, whoa, man, they gave me a tip. They blessed me because he's already blessed you. Don't dare come in here today and get out some little puny, apathetic, half in, half out, lukewarm, skinny male nutrition gift. You're all going to walk out of here today. You're going to go to Red Lobster because they're having a crab fest. I just got blessed. You're going to go to church's chicken and you're going to get your chicken and your fried okra and all that stuff. You're going to go home and you're going to get in your car and you're going to put gas in it. You're going to do all these things and, and then you want to come in here and, and just, you know, give a little bit of something. No, sir. No, ma'am. You say, but when I give, will God give it back to me? Well, absolutely, because when you sow seed, how many know it grows? But we have church people around America that say, well, I want to give a, a, a tithe and offering. I want God to give it back to me the next day. You know what? Anything that comes in overnight is a weed, not a seed. Listen to me. Let me tell you something. You don't, you don't want weeds in your life, so don't expect to give a seed and expect it to grow up, and, and the next day you're going to get blessed. That's weeds. I don't want weeds in my life. I want to plant a seed into Brownsville Assembly of God Church. I want the blessings and the finances that God has given me. I want them to be pressed down, shaken together, running over. I don't have a, a Pastor Kilpatrick Tither's blessing to give you today. I know some of you are upset about that. I need somebody to bless me. Uh, don't worry. He'll be back to bless you. But I'm here today just to tell you some truth, friend. You sow sparingly. You reap sparingly. You sow bountifully. You reap bountifully. That's not my opinions. That's the word of God. That's the law of the harvest. You need a blessing, then give. You want to be blessed, give. You want something to grow, you plant a seed. You want to give God a tip today, make it a big one. Pastor said, just tell him, we need a lot of money. <laughs> you know, I could have got up today and said, bless God, here's the offering. We need a lot of money. But I wanted to teach you something today. But now I'm going to tell you, hey, we need a lot of money. Do your best today. I'm going to go out in, 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 in a few days on a date with my wife, and inevitably people ask, what do you do? I'm a man of God. I'm a preacher. And so you know what? I want my tip to be the biggest in the house, not out of pride, but I want them to know, hey, there's people out there who have been blessed. They're blessings to others. Will you bless God with me this morning? Everyone stand to your feet right now. Hold that tithe and offering high up in the air if you've got it. And we're going to ask the Lord to bless this very holy, anointed time today, friend. This ain't just some kind of spiritual, religious routine. We're asking God to bless and anoint this time in the name of Jesus. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray today that as we give our best to you, Lord, as we give our best offering, as we sow seed into Brownsville Assembly of God through our tithes and our offerings, Lord, I pray that even if it doesn't sprout up tomorrow like a weed, Father, we'll plant that seed, and Lord, it will reap up. Abundant harvest in the name of Jesus. We claim it. We receive it. We thank you in advance for the work that you're already beginning to do through this incredible spiritual anointed time of giving our tithes and offerings in the storehouse. We, in Jesus' name, bless it. Amen. Everybody come and give your offerings to the Lord.
would be. Lift your hands this morning and worship him one last time. Father, we worship you in the house. We love you this morning and we lift you up. We bless your name this morning. We love you for who you are and for what you do. We bless your name. We worship you today. And everyone said amen. God bless you this morning. You may be seated. Just one quick announcement. We're all aware of the situation in Alabama with the Ten Commandments and Judge Moore. Uh, they've asked us to announce that this Tuesday night at 7.30 at the Judicial Building on Dexter Street uh, there in Montgomery, there will be a rally regarding the Ten Commandments. Uh, if you're interested in attending that, it will be this Tuesday. And uh, please be in prayer that... Uh, the will of God would be done and, and God would give us 
favor there in Montgomery. If you're here for the first time, we want to welcome you to Brownsville Assembly of God. We're honored to have you today. We're real excited to have our first-time guests. God bless you this morning. Our senior pastors, John and Brenda Kilpatrick, are not here today. They are on vacation, but he did call and ask and asked us to, um, uh, to remind everyone that he will be back in the pulpit next Sunday. Our pastor will be back. Amen. God, amen. God bless him. Looking forward to having Brother Kilpatrick back, and uh, he'll be preaching next Sunday. Uh, so be in prayer for him this week that God would just bless him and give him a time of rest and renew him in his body. And I know next Sunday he'll be itching and ready to go. Amen. It's going to be exciting. But today, we are honored to have our minister of music, our worship leader, uh, who's more than just a worship leader. He's a psalmist and a man of God. And we're excited to have Lendo Cooley. He's coming this morning to minister to us. Amen. Thank Amen. You. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, before I start, I've got, I'm wired up here. I look like I'm about to explode. Um, I have to negotiate all these wires. Before I, I start this morning, uh, what I'd really like to do the most is just um, kind of go backwards a little bit. Is that okay? Can I go backwards? I, um, I appreciate this church. I think more than you understand, I do. And uh, when I came here nine years ago, almost nine years ago, I saw this church go through enormous changes, enormous. And we were excited about those changes, or I was. I was excited to see what God was doing. It was a wonderful, wonderful time in 1995, and things happened so quickly, uh, so quickly, that we were all just holding on. It was one of those things that you didn't have time to contemplate your next move. All you did was just dig your nails in and hang on. And we were excited about getting back to church the next day to see what God would do. And it was a very wonderful time. But one of the things that happened here that has been addressed somewhat through the years, but something I want to say to you today in appreciation. I appreciate this church because you embraced what God did. And I appreciate you for embracing me because I know I was just a little different than the folks you had had before me. And you had had some really wonderful people. Tom was, was absolutely an absolute wonderful worship leader. I got to hear him once when I was here on a Wednesday night. But Tom and I are about, about as alike as salt and pepper. And uh, I remember when I came in here, I still had a little edge of rebellion in me, and I didn't want to be here, and I, my hair was long, and we were just doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And you put up with it. And uh, I owe you. I really do. I owe you a debt. What you did for me is you allowed me to grow up. You allowed me to grow up in the Lord. Because if you hadn't have, if you hadn't have been kind and patient, and you'd have done to me what many churches would have done, <laughs> what you would have done was fire me in three weeks. Hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more, no more, no. And I would have fired me too. I mean, looking back, but Pastor Kilpatrick in this church just embraced me. And uh, that's truly, truly the spirit of the Lord. And that's true Christianity because as a result, I'm able to stand here today because I was as damaged and as ready to leave the church as anybody who ever came and laid on this carpet. I was ready to quit more than most people. I was more skeptical than the people who were critics of revival. I don't think anybody could have written a more searing article than I could had I had a pen in my hand at the beginning of this revival because I wasn't sure I believed in any of it. But God in his great mercy through the years has softened me and softened my heart and I just want to tell you I owe that to you I really do and uh, I look around this morning and I see Joe and Helen Kaufman and 
you know, I love you, Helen. I'm, I don't love you as much as I used to, but I love you a lot. Uh, it's because a cheese braid has not made its, its way to my house in a few years. And uh, the cheese braid really causes me to love you a little more. Right now, I love XE Bass better than you. And uh, because, because what XE does is she gives me jams and jellies on a regular basis. And you know, I mean, that's the way to my heart right there. You give me some jam and jelly and a quilt, and I'm a happy man. I grew up in the South and in the country and proud of it. Amen. But uh, I just look around. I remember Lydia and Dan. I don't know if they're there this mo here this morning, but I remember Lydia and Dan. Lydia got the full brunt of my edginess when I first came because it, she talked to me on the phone. And, you know, she answers the phone, Lydia Davis. <laughs> Pastor put me on to her as a, a realtor, and it was so funny. She said, what kind of house do you want? I said, none of them in Pensacola. And she said, oh. I said, Lydia, can you get me something I can get out of in six months? Because that's about how long I'm going to stay there. That is exactly what I said to her. Wow. Those were the days, huh? <laughs> those were the days. And I was looking at the, the singers, uh, Carol and Lori and Teresa and all of them that were up here. And some of them we have a long history with. I, I remember Lori singing this morning. She used to sing over there and behind me in the beginning of revival. And uh, I think they were all just in shock. As, they were as in shock as I was that we were all here together. And look where we are now. After nine years, here we are, still putting up with each other. Isn't that awesome? That's a real true test of Christianity and faith. And, you know, it's great. But uh, since I'm waxing nostalgic this morning, is that okay? Since I'm waxing nostalgic this morning, one of the things that I'm so excited, and it's a rare day to have my mom in church with me, and I love having her here. Where did that mic go? It was here. Hey, I want her to come, and Nolan, turn this on, and make sure the piano's good and loud right there. Is it okay? I, oh, I don't know what time it is. Is this okay? It's okay? All right. This is my mom, Shirley, if you don't know. And, uh, and uh, she taught me everything I know. And some things, some th all the good stuff I know she taught me, okay? All the bad stuff came from my father. I'm learning that in my household. When the boys are good, they're mine. When they're not, they're hers. <laughs> but uh, I, I appreciate my mom, and uh, many of you don't, don't know. Uh, my mother's a preacher's wife, and her and my father have pastored a church they founded. Uh, we celebrated this year with them in the spring of the year 30 years in a little town with about 3,000 people. And their church attendance is about 10% of the town. So I think they've had success, don't you? Amen. Amen. And uh, you remember, I don't know if you remember the old days when we went there and we lived in the house trailer and we had the car that didn't have a reverse in it. We bought an old Toyota for like $500 and it was a wagon. It was silver and it never had a reverse in it. It was something I guess someone wanted to get rid of. Usually if you were the preacher back in those days in a small southern town, you got whatever anybody didn't want. It's kind of like uh, uh, when, you know, when the little boy brought the uh, chicken to church and, and uh, the pastor said, thank you so much for this wonderful chicken. And the, si the little boy said, oh, pastor, it was going to die anyway. <laughs> no problem. But that was kind of the mentality in, in northern Alabama in a small little town. And we lived in a little trailer the church gave us. And I remember going to school in that car, and Dad could never pull into one of those, those, uh, p those parking places that he, couldn't, that he had to back out of. We, a couple times he forgot, and we had to push the car. <laughs> and when you're 10, that's very embarrassing. And when you're, you know, I mean, it's just so embarrassing. And to be Pentecostal on top of that, that makes you very embarrassed. Because, and to be fat. I was fat, too. I mean, strike three, boom, you're out. I was fat. My mom had big hair, and we went to a Pentecostal church, and we lived 
in a house trailer with a car with no reverse. How much worse could life get? And everything was a sin. <laughs> Except to eat. We ate a lot to keep from sinning. But I love my mom because uh, what you don't know about my mom is she's a, a woman of prayer. And she comes from a history of women of prayer. And uh, I thank the Lord that she's prayed me out of hell several times. She's prayed me through some tight places. And uh, she's always been there for me. And, and she sings a song that, that I love because I'm a worshiper. And it's, it's kind of a song that really should should really move all of us to a degree. It's a song that talks about his presence and being in his presence. It's almost looking forward to being in his presence. And what will it be like? And before she sings it, I just want her to share a word with you. We're going to sing this song. We'll get right to the message. But this is my mom. Go ahead, mom. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> I don't know what to say after all that. <laughs> Except the Lord has been good. Praise God. He's been so good to me and to my family. The Lord raised me off my deathbed three times in my life. When the doctors had given me up, Hallelujah. said there was no more they could do. Thank you, Jesus. He came and raised me up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The doctor said I had cancer, had just a few months to live. I remember the devastation. If you've been told that, it's a death sentence. And I remember the devastation. And I remember sitting at the table when the doctor called and said, Miss Cooley, you have cancer. And I just went all to pieces and I began to weep and cry. And my husband come in and he didn't have a bit of sympathy. He <laughs> got me by the shoulders and he shook me. He said, Cheryl, that's what the doctor said. That's not what the word said. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Come on. So I stopped crying because I didn't have any sympathy. <laughs> They said, come back and we want to do more tests and we want to find out the extent. We want to find out what surgery you need, what treatment you need and all that. I went to my doctor and I said, this is not for me. I'm not doing this. I'm not going this route. He said, we want to do these tests. I said, okay. They did the test and I never will forget it. The phone rang that morning, and they were going to call Friday morning, and the phone rang, and Linda was in the bedroom, and he picked up the phone, and my husband picked up the phone, and the doctor said, Mr. Cooley, our tests show that your wife has no cancer. We don't know what happened. dancing down the hall, shouting and jumping like he does a lot of times. He was hollering, my mama don't have cancer, my mama's healed, my mama don't have cancer. Hallelujah. But you know what I want to tell you today? I don't care what the doctors have told you. All you have to do is get in his presence. In his presence, there's healing. Yeah. Hallelujah. In his presence, there's joy and peace everlasting. Yeah. Hallelujah. I want to sing the song, Standing in the Presence of the King. Today, I found myself in a most unusual place. All at once, 
I was standing face to face with someone I knew so well, yet I had never seen. I was standing in the presence of the King. away beneath my feet. Mortal man cannot write the songs that my heart sing when I'm standing in the presence of the King. Into his gates with thanksgiving yeah, come on. and into courts with praying with a joyous heart I begin to sing oh, for at last I am standing where he said that I could be I am standing in the presence sing the chorus with us. I sing.
His eye, sing that again. His eye is on. Is on. time everybody his eye is all the spirit and, and I, I know he watches me yes he does hallelujah come on give the Lord praise I said hallelujah. <laughs> you see why I like her so much? When you got a mom that can preach at home, you just live right. That's all there is to it. I remember when I was about nine, oh, I wasn't that. I was probably 10 years old, and I remember uh, at 10, I stole a car. Out of, a out of a store after my mama had said I couldn't have it and I remember when I I hid it under the bed and she didn't know I'd stolen it and one day she was cleaning the house I hate it when mama's clean under beds but she was under the bed cleaning and she found that car that I had asked for and uh, called me in the bedroom she's kind of like God you know God never asks a question unless he knows the answer you know he's trying to get you in the corner when he starts asking you stuff that you know he already knows. My mom was just like God. She said, what is this? Like she didn't know. What is this? Uh, it's a car, ma'am. Where did you get it? Uh, at the store, ma'am. How did you pay for it? She knew the answers to all that. She took me back to the bedroom and got the belt out. Now, that would be politically incorrect right now, I know. And you couldn't tell HRS that you did that. But she said, do you, would you like to lay down on this bed so I can spank you where you sit down? But if you move, I'm going to spank you wherever I hit you. And she looked at me, Pastor Randy, with fire in her eyes and a belt in her hand. And she said... She didn't ask me if I'd ride, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> she looked at me, Pastor, and she said, I hate a thief, and I hate a liar. And she said, I'd rather take you in the woods and shoot you today than to know I'd raised a, little, a man that was a thief and a liar. And from that attitude, she spanked me. See, that was kind of hard for some of you wimpy parents out there, but my mama. Y'all are descendants of Dr. Spock, but my mama didn't know who Dr. Spock was. She didn't watch Star Trek. The thing that she knew is that spank him and he'll straighten up. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, since I am a gleaner, I'm going to use my glasses if I could. I want you to turn to Hebrews 6 with me today. Amen. I am so uh, happy for this opportunity, and, uh, and I'm going to try my best. Matter of fact, well, let's go to Hebrews 11.1 1 first, and then we'll go back to 6. So stay there in Hebrews. Good, good book. You know, basically we read any of it because it's all good, but we're going to stay in a couple of places. 
I love the Word of God, and the older I get, the more I love it. The more I love the Word of God, because there's just nothing that you're going to do or deal with in your entire life that the Word of God doesn't speak to. There's never an issue in your life that you can't find between the pages of this book something that will touch you and change you. I'm going to entitle my talk today, Faith for Today, Hope for Tomorrow. I was praying when, when I got the call on Wednesday, John Michael, pastor's son, John Michael Kilpatrick called me and said, they want you to preach. And I said, uh, let me think about that. Okay, I will. And uh, I began to pray because the thing of it is, is I don't want to get up here and preach my agenda. See, I don't want to preach to you my agenda. I'm a worship guy and that's my agenda. But I didn't feel the Lord speaking this week to preach about it. Now, it's going to get its way in there because I'm a worshiper. That's all. I can't help it. It just kind of has a way of sweeping through everything I do. I can't help it. But when I, when I started praying, I said, Lord, give me a word that will bless Brownsville. Give me a word that will encourage your people. Because I sense in the Spirit that there are many here in the same place. And I'm going to tell you in a moment after I read this scripture verse where I feel some of us are this morning. And I'm going to try to address that. Hebrews 11.1 1 is one of my favorite scriptures. Now, I, I have a love for the King James Version, absolutely. Uh, but there are occasions that I do digress to texts that aren't necessarily really the Bible. Those, those <laughs> occasionally I'll use like the nearly inspired version or are those. I, I know they're not as holy and godly, but occasionally I will digress to them because sometimes I feel like they speak a little clearer to this generation who didn't grow up on Elizabethan English. So this morning I'm going to use the NIV to read this scripture. Now when I quote, I quote out of the King James Version. I don't know what it is, I guess because of where I grew up. Because this scripture reads just a little differently, but I like what it says, 11.1. It says this, now, this is a familiar scripture to us, but it says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, the King James says, now faith is a substance of things hoped for, but the evidence not seen, which is wonderful. But there's something about that phrase, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. I love when I'm, when I'm preaching, anytime I'm studying, and let me recommend it to you, those of you who even don't preach, I want to recommend the Webster's Dictionary from 1828. It's the most wonderful tool that you'll have in your entire library. And I don't preach any sermon without usually picking a couple of, of words out of that book and going back to see what Noah Webster had to say because he used the scriptures to to interpret words and to define words and and I looked up the word faith because faith is kind of used a lot in secular terminology right now but a lot of people don't understand what it is are you keeping the faith what does that mean it's become an ambiguous term what is faith Oh, that's that church that believes that if you just lay hands on Cadillacs, they're yours. Oh, that's those people, uh, Faith. Uh, oh, that, she's a great singer, isn't she? That went right over some of your heads. She's married to that guy who wears cowboy hats. What's his name? Tim McGraw. Yeah, Tim McGraw. Faith. Oh, faith has kind of just gotten tangled up in our society. So I thought, let's go back to an old translation of the word to find out where we went wrong with the word faith. And here's what Noah Webster says. He said, faith is the ascent of the mind to the truth of a proposition advanced by another belief on probable evidence of any kind. Faith is the ascent of the mind to the truth of a proposition advanced by another belief on probable evidence of any kind. Faith is being sure of the things you hope for and certain of the things you can't see. 
When I looked at the word hope, I looked it up. I love looking up words. Listen to what hope is. You know, hope has a negative thing in a lot of people's eyes. They, well, I hope so. Well, I hope so. Well, you're looking better. Well, I hope so. I hope tomorrow it won't rain. I hope. Again, we've used this word so many times in the English language that we don't understand its true meaning. Here's what it says. Hope is a desire of some good accompanied with at least a slight expectation of, of obtaining it or a belief that something is obtainable. So when I say I hope, I am saying that I really believe I can obtain that. It's a positive word. Hope differs from wish or desire in this, that it implies some expectation of obtaining the good desired or the possibility of possessing it. Hope, therefore, always gives pleasure or joy, whereas wish and desire may be, may produce or be accompanied with pain and anxiety. Hope, faith, faith is being sure of what I hope for and being certain of what I cannot see. The word faith and the word hope are stumbling blocks to many who want to come into the kingdom of heaven because you must believe that God is and that he has a son named Jesus. It takes faith to believe those things. But let me say in the beginning that it's not nearly as much faith is required for that as is required for some of the other doctrines that I see in the world. Because the foundations of the world were built on the knowledge of God, so it's a whole lot easier for me to have faith in Him. But all of us have to realize in this room that you're here today not because, I hope you're not here because Grandma was a Christian and she's told you you had to go to church. I hope you're here because you have faith in Christ Jesus and you have faith that he's the Son of God and you have faith in believing and you have hope that he will return again I hope that's why we're here I believe that's why we're here God has indeed brought us into the kingdom by adoption through the blood of his son Jesus Christ he has taught us the power and the necessity of repentance we have learned, bless the Lord, we have learned around here about repentance, have we not? If you haven't gotten repentance in your head after nine years of what we've been going through, you'll never get it. He has taught us the power and the necessity of, we have, listen, we have learned that repentance is a continual part of the transformation into Christ likeness. And we embrace that. I've learned that repentance is an essential part of worship. People say, oh, I want to just worship deeper. Well, you must repent deeper. Because the closer you get to a holy God, the less holy you feel. And so God starts showing you things. But what's beautiful about the way he does it is he doesn't do it the way some preachers do. He doesn't give you a nice heaping, or your mom, a nice heaping scoop of guilt with that. Here's some salvation with a big pile of guilt to help you out. <laughs> guilt, I said this a couple weeks and it kind of went over like cold water, but you know, it's just truth. It, yours is how yours is, mine is how mine is. And my faith is this way. Guilt doesn't motivate me. Because I grew up in church, I know all about it. You can't make me feel any guilter than I already do. You can preach to me how awful I am, and I already know how awful I am. And you can tell me what I should do, but there's always been something down inside of my heart that said, will somebody show me how? Will you show me how? I know what I should do. Preaching, powerful preaching tells me what I should do. But I need someone or somewhere, somehow, to tell me how. 
How? And I hear the cry out there in the streets and in the malls and the airports. Pastor Randy, I hear him saying, how? I know what I need to do. I'm not happy with where I am. How can I go somewhere else? <laughs> so glad you asked. <laughs> the question is, how do we go forward into what God has in the future for our lives? Many are on a merry-go-round. They repent and start to walk after God only to find in a few days they're right back where they started. They repent and come to a saving knowledge of Jesus and they cry a little bit and they get on this merry-go-round and they go full circle and a month later, a week later, a year later, they're right back at the getting on place again. And it creates frustration in people. And it ebbs away at their faith. It's like eating at the rocks on the seashore, the way the ocean claps against and erodes. Over and over, this rebuilding of the foundation of repentance to dead works, what it does, it just starts eating at the rock. And over and over, we're jumping all over, and we're right back where we started. Hebrews 6, 1 says this, Therefore, leaving the principles and the doctrines of Christ, let us go on into perfection. Another word for perfection here is completion. Let us go on into perfection or completion, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Now let me make you clearly understand something. There's a difference the way a Christian will repent as he sees the holiness of God and he sees his own humanity. And then there is a repentance that causes us to come out of the world into the kingdom of God, where we see that we don't fit, that we have no hope, and we see Christ, and we hear the word of the Lord, and we hear a preacher or, or a friend witness to us, and we realize we need God, and we repent. See, I want you to clearly define those two in your head. They're both repentance, but there's two kinds. There's the kind that brings you out of darkness into light, but then there's a repentance that brings you into deeper holiness. And we don't need to confuse those two. And I think sometimes around here through the years, people have gotten confused on those two. They're like, oh, I need to get saved again. Oh, I need to do this all over again. No, you don't. You need to just walk in continual holiness and in faith and repentance to be like God. And when you fall, you don't jump out of the boat. You get right back in and you repent again and you move on. But many people don't get past the starting point because they walk out the door and their humanity slaps them in the face. And always when you sin, always when you fail, guilt will always come and come to you. And trust me, guilt doesn't come from the Lord. If you feel guilty today this, in this service, it isn't because the Lord is putting it on you. Because guilt goes right along with its brother called shame. And those two things will not redeem you. And they don't come from the Father. But there's a beautiful thing called conviction that comes from the Lord. And what conviction says is, Son, there's something we need to correct here for you to go on. And I want to bring you up to another place in me so that you don't fight with this anymore. That's conviction. That's a wonderful feeling. That, it, it, it has a, a kind of a negative feeling in a way because it's a decision you make. I want to go on into God, so I'm going to take His conviction and move forward in Him. Do you all understand where we are? Okay, good. I'm going to move on. If we're going to move on past this little place of repentance, then we're going to have to have a vision for the future. If we don't have a vision for the future. We don't know where we're going. Here's another thing. We must also have a vision and plan for the present. Many people have future vision, but no present plan. And they're afraid that they're going to offend the Holy Spirit if they make a plan. I said this for years. God can't direct a parked car. 
You have to put that baby in D and put your foot on the accelerator and move it. And God can direct you. But he can't direct you if you're always sitting here dreaming about what the future is going to be. It's easy to preach the future. It's all over the Word of God. I can tell you what I want to see happen in the future. But how am I going to get there? See, this morning I want to deal with the old basic foot on the floor stuff. How are we going to get there? How are we going forward in the Lord? You're going, well, you're trying to preach over Brownsville. No, no, no. I, I'm not the pastor of this church. Pastor Randy, Pastor Kilpatrick, they're the pastors. They'll cast a vision for this church. That's not my place. I'm talking about you. I'm not talking about the vision of the house. I'm talking about your vision, Amen. your future. I want to see you this morning get off of the merry-go-round and put one foot in front of the other and head a direction that you've planned and head a direction that God has given you a vision to go. Amen. Because if you can't, you're going to stall out. Many want to see God do great things in their lives, but mistake the sovereignty of God for an occasion to do nothing. Many want to see God do great things in their lives, but mistake the sovereignty of God as an occasion to do nothing. Well, God's going to handle it all. It'll be all right. He's just going to put my faith in Him. And uh, it's just, you know, if God wants me to do that, He'll just plop me down in the middle of it. You know, if God wants me to be wealthy, He'll just bring it to me. Well, if God wants my family to be saved, if I just pray hard enough and fast long enough, God's going to do it. Not without you. Not without you or a plan. God will breathe on the plans you've made. But if you don't have a plan, he has nothing to breathe on. I'm just waiting on the next level at Brownsville. You wait till you're 80. What are you going to do now? <laughs> Many people want a wonderful marriage, wonderful children, financial prosperity, a church full of excitement and glorious presence of God. But they make no investment into the present or the future to bring these things about, believing that God will do it somehow all by himself with his sovereignty. Can God do all these things by himself? Yes! But God has put our obedience into the equation. He says, if you will, I will. If you can believe, I can do it. Now, can God do it if we don't believe? Yeah, he's God. But he won't. Can God save the nations without us praying? Yes. But he won't. Because you and your prayer have power with God. And the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And God won't do much without it. Do you understand how important you are? You're going, oh, just an old piece of junk. God just drug up off this, out of the river in the sludge of life and just set me down on the pew. And I'm just a piece of junk and I just need to repent. I'm such a... I'm, a, I'm just awful. <laughs> and God says, if you will do it and say it, yeah. if you'll believe it, yeah. I'll do it. Yeah. But without you, oh, well. I'm excited about the future. But what some of you in this place need to know right now is what can I do today? When I was praying, this is what I was hearing the Lord say. Tell them what to do today. Give them some hope and faith. Remember, without the present, there can be no future. And what's our text? Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. I like to put it this way. Patience keeps your hope alive. Hope keeps your faith alive. And faith keeps you alive. 
I thought about this and I thought, well, can I come up with a little, you know, Jesus used parables, why don't we? So I thought, well, you know, I'm going to try a parable. So here's what I've come up with. Let's pretend. Can everybody get with me? Can, can we get? Do y'all remember Romper Room? I see Johnny and Susie. Imagine. I want you to use your imagination. It's not an evil thing, as long as it's not an evil imagination. I have just boarded an ocean liner. I'm going to make a transatlantic cruise. I've gone out and bought the appropriate clothes. I am excited and ready to go. I've packed. I've done it all. In the middle of my cruise, it's going well until we get smack in the middle of the Atlantic. And an alarm sounds that we need to abandon ship because we struck an iceberg. We're taking on water. And I just got to tell you, I know it's supposed to be women and children first. But I'm getting in the lifeboat, folks. I push my way in and I get in the lifeboat and I grab what provisions, provisions I can get because the ship is going down. It's dark. It's cold. I will, hypothermia will kill me in a matter of minutes when I hit that cold icy water. And I know this. So I've got to get on the lifeboat. Once I'm on the lifeboat, it's lowered into the ocean. And the ship has sank. And here I sat all alone in my lifeboat because I didn't lay anybody in my boat. This is my story. I'll do it how I want to, but nobody's on my boat with me. It's just me, okay? It's a private boat. <clears throat> Once I'm in the lifeboat, I will try and rely on hope that one day soon I'll be found. Maybe a vessel will come in the next few hours. Maybe when the sun comes up, an airplane will see us. Surely the Coast Guard knows the plane, the, the ship went down. Somebody's got to come soon. And I'm sitting out here in the middle of this cold, dark ocean. And my hope is alive, and it's saying, somebody's coming. Remember what hope is? It's moving your mind into something that's a definite possibility. As the days wear on, and there's no rescue in sight. Then I have to pull out my faith. And I have to come up with a potential plan for survival. I have hope of rescue. But my faith causes me to move into action. What actions am I going to take? I'm all alone. Oh, I grabbed some provisions before I left the ship. Let's see what I have. See, my faith starts moving into, into action. I need a plan. What's my plan? Well, my plan might begin with an assessment of what I have. How much food do I have? How much water do I have? How long can I live on this food and water? I need to conserve it because I never know when I'm going to be rescued. I've got to make a plan to survive this disaster. If I eat it all in one day and drink it all in one day, what's going to happen if this thing takes five days? What if it takes 10 days? What if it takes 30 days? I've got to make my provisions last and stretch. What am I going to do? Then I start thinking about, do I have something to cover me up in case of a rainstorm? Is there a tarp? Is there some canvas? Is there anything? Uh, the next thing I start thinking about is, do I have oars? Is there something I can navigate this boat with to move instead of just sit here and wait, either on death or rescue? Is there something I can do to make this thing move? My plan might continue with a consideration of what resources I have. Do I have something I can catch a fish with? Do I have something I can catch water, the rainwater to drink? I hope that I will be rescued, but my faith forces me to make a plan. Because faith is being sure of what I hope for. And certain of what I do not see. I am certain that someone's coming, so I've got to survive until they get here. But if my hope gives out on me, I'm a dead man. Because I'll eat all my provisions, I'll try not to survive, and I'll wind up emaciated, and there won't be a cabin boy to eat. 
I'll just be all alone by myself with nothing but desolation. The scripture says hope deferred makes the heart sick. When you lose hope, what have you got? I want to talk to you just for a moment about four hopes of a believer. And this is going to be quick. You're going to be amazed how fast I preach today. You ever just go through days and you just go, man, I'm not getting anywhere. I'm just not getting anywhere. I don't feel like my kids are what I want them to be. I don't feel like I'm what I want to be. I, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't like my job. I don't like this. I don't like that. What am I going to do? Words like that will begin to eat and decay your hope away. And without your hope, your faith can't act. Your faith has to have some hope to attach itself to. You've got to have... What if I had just faith? Well, I would be believing and believing, but what am I believing in? My belief has to be placed in hope that something's going to happen. You ever heard, heard people talk about who grew up in, in the ghettos or they grew up in the projects or they grew up in, in, in terrible, terrible places and it seemed like no way out and they would call the situation hopeless? You know, you watch the inner city a lot of times on television. You see these people walking through these streets and they're desolate. And you know, when you're not living there, it's easy for you to get judgmental and go, hey, I'd just get up and I'd go get me a job and I'd get out of there. But see, you didn't grow up in that world. And you don't understand that there's only one way out of there. Either you sell drugs or you die. One way or the other is about the only way you're going to get out of there. Because nobody else has ever shown another path to get out. And people are hopeless. They have no hope. There are people in this room that have no expectations of future because the past has not been very rewarding. They have no expectations because their father failed. Their mother failed. And everyone in their family failed. And they've been told over and over and over, you'll never make it. I loved Pastor Randy's sermon last week about fathers. I want to just grab part of that and say that many people have never had a father to put his arms around them and affirm them. They've never had a mother that told them, that, that gave them what? Hope. You're a loser just like your daddy. Your daddy was a loser. He abandoned me and you just wait until you can get out of the house. And the past is full of this. So you sit here in Brownsville and you go, I love the presence of the Lord I feel here. I love the revival. I love the glory of the Lord. But where am I going? Where am I going? What am I going to do? Let me talk to you about four hopes. And I hope it'll give you hope. I hope it'll charge you up. I want to talk about you for a minute and me. I want to talk about the hope for my future. It's okay to talk about yourself sometimes. Michael Rowan does it all the time. It's okay <laughs> for you to talk about yourself. I'm kidding. I'm joking, Michael. I do it all the time too. Let me ask you a couple of really hard questions that you've probably never thought about. I want to ask you some in the ministry. Some of the ministry folks here, some of the Bible school students. Let me ask you, what is your heart's desire? What is your heart's desire? And don't give me that can. Oh, I just want to love the Lord. That is such a cop out. We all want to love the Lord. That goes without saying. I just want to make heaven my home. I remember testimonies when I was a boy. I'd like to say tonight that I truly do love the Lord and I thank you for all he's done for me. I want y'all to pray that I can truly make heaven my home some sweet day. Glory to God. <laughs> That's a no-brainer. If you got saved and you love Jesus, you want to see him and you want to make heaven your home. But let's get down where you're living today. 
What is your heart's desire? What is it you want? What is it? Many people don't stop in this age and day we live in, the time that we live in. We're fast. We're running. We're on TV. We're in TV. We're all over here. We're at work. We're in the CD store. We're at the mall. We're there. We're spread out. We're going to soccer practice. We're going to baseball practice. We're all over the place. And we never stop and go, wait a minute. What do I desire? We get worried about the temporal needs. Well, I want a better suit. I want more money. I want a raise. I want more stuff to do. So you want more stuff so you can take better care of the stuff. And then you get so much stuff that you can't take care of all the stuff you got. And then when you get all this stuff and all this money, you look back and go, man, I wish I was back in the old days when I didn't have so much stuff. Because now my stuff needs attention. And now i got to hire people to take care of my stuff because I don't have time to take care of my stuff. And now i got to pay somebody. Now i got to make more money to hire people to take care of the stuff that I don't have time to take care of. Because my stuff is eating me alive. My prosperity is killing me. And with all this flurry of activity, nobody takes any time to go, now wait a minute. If I lay in the grave tomorrow, what is it that I want to do before I die? It's an important soulish question to ask. I was never more challenged. A couple Sundays ago, I, I was able to, you were kind enough and, and released me from ministry here to be able to go to my, I know it's getting late. Can y'all stay with me another 15 minutes? I'll hurry. Let her, in the South, we say, let her rip, tater chip. Uh, <laughs> I got sayings for days like that. But I, I went to St. Louis, Missouri. I flew and I, and I, I uh, went to my cousin's funeral. My cousin was a little short, heavy guy. He was probably five, six, and about that wide. I mean, he was just a little, little square, round man. I mean, a little short, round man. Can't be square and round, can you? And, and he's he a preacher. And he started off as a youth pastor, Michael. And he, and he, he was just a preacher. And he had visions of doing great and mighty things. And he, he started a couple of churches, pastored three or four churches in his lifetime. And, uh, you know, he was always jolly, always happy, and loved food. I mean, I never, ever met a man who enjoyed eating more than him. I mean, it's like his soul would explode when he got to sit at the table. I remember one time his wife told me, she said, you got to do something with Bob. I said, why? She said, well, he's on a diet. And I said, yeah, he's always on a diet. And she said, yeah, I know it. You know what I caught him doing tonight? I said, what? She said, well, I heard something in the kitchen about 3 a.m. And she said, I wondered what in the world it was. And I looked over and Bob was not in the bed. And I went into the kitchen. And he said, she said, guess what I found? I said, what? Bob had pulled a kitchen table, a uh, kitchen chair, up to the refrigerator and opened the door and was sitting with the refrigerator door open, just pulling stuff out and eating it and having the time of his life. Can you get a picture of that? You know, it's just by the light of the refrigerator, just... That's how much he loved to eat, but we always saw Bob as kind of jolly, and, and, and Bob, would, Bob was one of the kind of guys that you could call any time, and he'd talk with you. He talked me into marrying Amber. That's one thing I have to bless him for, because he, he talked me into marrying her. He came down in the middle of revival when I was thinking about marrying Amber, and, uh, and I, I needed a little push, because I, I was 33 and single, and Bob stayed at my house for a week, and he sat there and said, now, this is a beautiful girl. She's a godly girl. And, it, you know, you're 33. It's time to get on down the road. Let's get married. <laughs> well, but, Bob, I'm afraid of... I don't care what you're afraid of. You ain't ever going to get something if you don't try and take a risk. You're never going to get a reward if you don't take a... But what if it don't work out? What if she turns out to be Elvira? I mean, what if it's like... <laughs> what if we get married and then she turns into a hellcat? I mean, what... We know that scripture says it's better to dwell on the roof than in the house with a container. I mean, I, I don't, 
I don't know if I want, what if I have to move to the roof? I mean, what, what if she's sweet now and she turns into like Cuella DeVille and she, you know, and it's like she unzips her face and it just comes out and this green-eyed demon just comes out and makes my life hell. At least now I know what I got. I know it's me and I know me and it's comfortable. He said, that's exactly right. Do you want to be a father? Yes. Well, how are you going to do that? Immaculate conception? <laughs> you got me there, Bob. You got me there. It will take, it, it, yeah, you're right. It will take another warm body around this house. And I love Amber with all my heart, but that push to get me to do it, you know, after 30-something years of being single, it's a big jump for a guy that's, that's scared. And Bob was the kind of guy, he just, we sat till four and five in the morning talking about these. That kind of guy is the kind of person Bob was. I went to his funeral. I learned things, Michael, about Bob I never knew. And they challenged me. They, they left his casket open the whole funeral, which normally they don't do now. And there was his casket. And I said, I said, who's preaching? And they said, there's no preacher. And there's going to be some people just eulogized. And I said, oh, okay. So I sang a couple of songs at the funeral, and the, the, the MC of the funeral, I guess, what you call it, <laughs> master of ceremonies, <laughs> the, the ringmaster, it was a two-hour funeral. He stood up, the officiating minister, how's that? That sounded a little more religious, didn't it? Glory to God. He stood up. And he said, what the family has asked is that every minister who's in this building today, that Bob helped you get started in the ministry, would you stand? Now, this room would not seat but about 400 people, and people were standing outside in 98-degree weather. They couldn't even get in. Of my little, little chubby cousin that no one thought that much of. Forty preachers stood up and ten of them stepped forward and out of the ten who stepped forward two of them pastored churches one of them's name is Rick Shelton he pastors Life Christian Center in St. Louis Missouri that's the church that Joyce Meyer came out of another church several thousand people Rick Shelton who pastored Joyce Meyer in this large church stood up there and he looked over into the casket and he said when I started in the ministry when I started in the ministry my first call was to my pastor I had never preached but one sermon and I said pastor I've quit my job and me and my wife and little son are going full-time in the evangelistic ministry and his pastor said son I love you so much but please take this the way I mean it. You're a good man, but don't quit your job. Go beg them to let you have your job back. Because I know people who will make it and the people who won't, and you won't make it. You don't have anything under the hood, son. You need to just quit. You need to get back and get your job. And he was being pastoral. He was loving. It wasn't cruel. He was just trying to, I mean, think about it. You're a pastor and you see a kid who can't even preach and he leaves his job. What would you do? I'd do the same thing. <laughs> but not Bob. Bob had been Rick's youth pastor in years gone by. Rick says, my second call, Pastor Rick says, my second call, as he's looking at my cousin, he says, my second call was Bob Smith. I said, Bob, I've left my job, and I'm going to full-time ministry. And Bob said, well, son, I'll bet you need somewhere to preach. He said, well, yes, sir, I do. He said, well, can you preach? He said, well, I've preached once. He said, well, get down here. So he drove from St. Louis to Alabama, Aliceville, Alabama, preached for my cousin on Sunday night. After that service, Rick said, Bob came up to me and put his arm around me and said, oh, son, that's one of the best sermons I've ever heard. He said, Here's the offering that came in. I'm going to give it to you. He said, and here's a little something extra to get you down the road. He said, I opened the check. It was $500 from Bob personally. He pastored 100 people. $500 for a pastor of 100 is big money, folks. 
That's like you just writing a $500 check. It's not easy. And he said, do you have anywhere else to preach, Rick? Rick said, no, Bob, I don't. He said, I've already taken care of that. I've called and I've got you 14 churches lined up. Rick said at that funeral, he said, for the next 14 days, I preached every night. And he said, you know what? Bob got in the car with me and, and got, a, got his second man in, in the church to preach for him and drove to every one of those services with me and sat right there on the pew and listened to me preach. And he said, I preached the same sermon 14 times. And he said, every time I preach that sermon, Bob said, I promise you, Rick, every time I hear it, it's like fresh manna to me. It just gets better and better and better and better. Now, let me tell you something. Bob never pastored a church over 300 people. Bob never preached on TBN. Bob never made a sermon series on CD or video. But here stood a pastor that had had worldwide influence saying that this man started me. What did this man do? Bob gave Rick hope. Hope and encouragement that, son, you can make it. I believe in you. Many people in the church have never had anybody to say, I believe in you. I was in Pennsylvania. I had four boys walk up after my sermon the other night, and they said, would you pray for us? We need deliverance from alcohol. And I said, where are you? He said, we're in a home trying to get free of alcohol. How long have you been clean? 30 days. I said, son, if you can stay clean 30, you can stay clean 300. If you can stay clean 300, you can stay clean three years. If you can stay clean three years, you can stay clean 30 years. Kid looked at me like, what? I said, I'm going to prophesy over you. And he said, you're going to do what? <laughs> and I reached up and put my hands on those. There's a black boy and a couple of boys, three boys, three white boys there. And I laid hands on them. And I called their names. I said, what's your name? And I said, I want to tell you something. You're a good man. You're a good man. You're not like your father. And there have been people before you that have stayed clean indefinitely, and you will be one of them. You are going to be in the house of the Lord. You are going to be a man of God. You are going to speak the word of the Lord. You can. I believe you can. And man, I just started speaking words. And I was seeing Bob laying in the casket the whole time. I was saying, God, I'm not like Bob. I want to be like Bob. When I die... So what is your desire? I got to move on. Let me ask you this. If you have a desire, then what steps are you going to take to accomplish that desire? See, all of us want to look great with our shirt off. But you know, it takes a commitment to do that. I'm sorry, y'all. I know I'm supposed to be a preacher and I'm supposed to say things, but it's always been a secret desire of mine to mow my shirt, mow my yard without my shirt on. And, and, and I'll tell you, it's not, I promise, it's not because I want anybody to see me. It's just one time I'd like to look down and see no fat jiggling. But you see, if I have that desire, I can't just one day do that. I got to go to the gym and I got to push the plate back and there's a way to get that out, but I got to have a plan. The reason I don't have that in place right now is because I haven't made a plan. <laughs> Every day, I must find ways to incorporate Christ-likeness into my personal world. Because the only way I'm going to get where I'm going is to be like my Father. The only way I'm going to accomplish my goal is to become like the Lord, to be an encourager, an uplifter. Some t oh, hear me on this one. This is not in my notes. I'm feeling preaching now. Let me tell you, sometimes you've got to look in somebody else and see what you want to happen for you and start blessing them that they'll accomplish what you can't. 
And let me tell you what happens. Because that's the way the kingdom works, sooner or later you're going to find a situation where suddenly your blessings overtake you. This thing is wearing me out. Give me a microphone. Turn it on. Get, that thing is like to eating my lunch. I can't. Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, it sounded good, but my ears felt like it's been eaten off me. I don't. Somebody said it's wrong to make a plan. Let me tell you what the Lord says in Jeremiah 29. He says, I've got a plan for you. I've got a, you know what it says? Read this with me. Uh, you know it, quote it. You don't have to look it up. We've got to hurry. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not calamity, to give you a future and a hope. If the Father in heaven was willing to make a plan for my future, then I must be like him. And the only way I can be like him is to make indeed a plan for my own future. Hallelujah. Number two, second hope. A hope for my children. What do I want my kids to be? What do I want my kids to know? Because my kids are going to do things I can't do. And my investment in them is going to be the hope of the reward of the future. When you look at an oak tree out here, you realize that somebody, somebody a couple of generations ago, either put an acorn in the ground or put a little sapling. And guess what? The person who put that sapling in the ground would never appreciate the shade of the tree. They would never swing from its limbs. Their children would never swing from its limbs. But their great-grandchildren would be able to look at this sprawling live oak and build a tree house in it and swing from it because they had vision and hope for the future. If your little life is all you're concerned about, you're going to be miserable, all of it. But when you get a hope for the future and you say, you know, I'm going to put something down that somebody else, after I'm gone, is going to appreciate, it gives your life a purpose and it gives you a vision to shoot for. Hallelujah. I got to hurry. I got to hurry. I'm just running through the best part. When my children, I want to teach them the Word of God myself. I don't want to depend on you to do it. I love Sunday school. I love Christian school. But I, as the father of my children, want to teach them the Word of God myself. And I want to example what the Word of God says in front of them myself. That's my plan. How am I going to do that? Well, we're going to have to memorize Scripture, aren't we? And we're going to have to show ideas of how we can live those Scriptures. Number two, I'm going to equip them for the future. I'm going to make sure they have an education. I'm going to make sure they learn how to discern people and learn the presence of the Lord. I want my kids to know and have equipment for the future that can cause them to succeed in life. But you see, it takes a plan. I want to invest into the things that will outlive me. Not just education, but an inheritance of godliness. We must understand that we need to do what is right before our children to leave them a pattern of godliness to live by. Instead of some of you sitting here today and looking back and going, my dad was just not the man he should have been. You should be able to look back and say, my dad was a man of God and I want to be a man of God like him. And guess what? You can't fix that, but you can start right now and say, I will put my foot down and I will be the man I want my kids to look back at and go, I want to be like him. It's time to quit trying to be like Mike. Because Mike's got illegitimate children hanging out everywhere. Mike's got... Oh. The ball players, 70% of the NBA have illegitimate children. 70%. And our kids want to be like them. Because our fathers are absent. And they're not setting a pattern for the children to follow. I want to put something down. I want God to teach me. And guess what? The Heavenly Father is the best one to teach you. You're going, oh, I want to learn from Him how to be a father. Can I learn how to be a father? 
The Heavenly Father knows how to teach you how to be a father. I said the Heavenly Father knows how to teach you. What kind of mother do you want to be? Well, you got to start today learning and setting a plan in motion. It isn't just going to creep up on you. I'm trying to hurry. Well, here's what you have to do. Titus 2, 12 says this. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That means we can, folks. That means even without revival service every night and Steve Hill preaching a sermon of repentance, you can live righteously and godly before your family. You can do it. You can do it. I believe in you. Number three, hope for eternity. Paul said, if I had only hope in this life, I would be of all men most miserable. If this was all there was. See, America is fascinated right now with only what's happening now. They're caught up in the moment, in the day. What's the new song? You know, it's like, you read, read the paper, listen to people. It's just, it's the same thing over and over and over. It's so shallow. It's so mundane. But see, I have a future. I have a future in eternity. And I have a reason. I have something that's pushing me on. What is your desire? What's pushing you on? There will be a time when suffering will be no more. There will be a time when there will be no more war. There will be a time when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords sits on the throne of this world and he is bowed down to by every knee and every tongue will confess. That's my hope. And I am his kid. Isn't that great? <laughs> Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Revelation 21.4 says, And God shall wipe away the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. That's my hope for the future. It's the eternal kingdom of God. Now, finally... My fourth hope is the one I want to close on and I want you to hear or you miss the whole thing. My hope for the coming kingdom of God. I didn't say the coming of the Lord. I have a hope that He's coming. I believe He's coming back and I believe it's soon. But I see myself not as one that's just waiting to see if He's going to come back or when. I look at myself as a person who sees the kingdom of God and I'm asking myself what can I do to bring him back quicker what can I do to fill my place in this kingdom what can I do to occupy until he comes what can I do to bring the kingdom and the glory of the Lord faster somebody said that's a sovereign act no you're in the equation you're in the equation you're in the equation. The Bible says he's waiting for the Jews to invite him back. What can I do to make that happen? I can't just come to church every Sunday and wait on the glory. That's part of it, but that ain't all of it. I've got to do something in my city that brings the kingdom of heaven to my city. I got to start as a father in my home and do some things that will cause the glory of God to be in my house. I got to do some things on my job that will cause the glory of God. I don't mean grab a Bible and wave it at them either. I mean do some things. Live godly. Have a spirit of love. Have a spirit of forgiveness. Give. Have mercy. Offer hope to my office. Offer hope to my employer. Make him wish that everybody he had was a believer. Instead of, oh my Lord, I never want to hire another Christian. I've heard employers say that. I don't want to hire another Christian. They say a lot, but they, it's like Michael was saying. I, he doesn't want to give off a bad impression in restaurants. I must develop a kingdom mentality. And the only way I can develop a kingdom mentality is to fall in love with the king. You knew that worship thing was coming, didn't you? Well, here it is. I can't be a part of a kingdom when I don't love the king. 
If I am, then I am a forced subject that something is being forced upon me. But this kingdom of heaven is not a kingdom that you're forced into. It's one that you join. And it's one that you move into at will because you have that desire in your heart to love the king. You can't get an idea for what God wants in his heart if you don't love him. I must realize that I'm a part of God's kingdom and therefore my greatest desire must be to bring pleasure to my king. He must, I love John 3.30, it says, he must increase, I must decrease. It means I'm a worshiper. That means whatever brings him glory, I want him to have. Oh, glory, I'm almost done. Hang with me just a minute more. I must see that a life of worship and communion is the greatest gift I can give to my king. That's why I look up in these lights sometimes. Y'all think I'm nuts or on drugs. And I look up there and I go, Lord, did you like that? Well, here's some more. Whew. And that's why I'm like waving at you, trying to get you to give him some more. Because I love my king. And I love his kingdom. And it's my desire to see his kingdom happen, not mine. I don't want to build my kingdom. I don't want to build my wealth. I don't want to build my prosperity unless it can fit into his kingdom. So I can bring him more glory. Yeah, I'm almost done. <laughs> oh, this is the good part. I love this. I must see the unbeliever as a potential worshiper. When I see a sinner come into the kingdom, I'm filled with joy because I see that God has one more person to bring him glory. My hope is to see God's glory fill the earth. My hope for the kingdom of God. Somebody says, Lindell, how is it that you worship the way you do? How can you go night after night after night after night and worship? It isn't because I'm good. It's because I have a vision. I am part of a kingdom. And this service is not my kingdom. Whether this is a home run or a foul, it isn't the whole thing. This is a skirmish or a battle. It isn't the war. Do you understand? When I get up to worship the Lord in a public place, I'm going to give Him glory. And I'm going to ask Him to come. But if He doesn't come, guess what? He's still going to get glory. Because I have a hope in the kingdom of heaven. And it pushes me forward. When I'm tired, when I'm restless, when I'm discouraged, it tells me that there's something better coming. My faith says get up and prepare because something's coming. But see, it may not be the something you're looking for. Oh, I hope things go to another level at Brownsville. Well, it would be fun, wouldn't it? But what if it don't? I'm still going to love him. I'm not wasting time in Brownsville waiting on something to come. I am coming with an offering for my king. I'm coming with something to pour at his feet because he's still good. He's still God. And there's still many who don't know him. And I want them to know my king. I want them to worship my king because it's not about me. It's about him. Yes. Yes. It's about him. And my hope is in him. My faith is in him. I wish somebody would help me preach. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, many people, this is the last thing, many people are comfortable with the things that they hope. But few are willing to bring faith into action and put legs on it. I'm ready to do that, aren't you? I'm ready to leave this place. I'm ready to see some of you leave this place today. And instead of saying, well, I wonder what's going to happen. I want you to go home. And I want you to think, what am I going to do tomorrow to bring about what God's put in my heart? What can I do in the morning when I get up? Which part? Which part? 
what, how can I build this house? A brick at a time. How do you eat an elephant? Bite at a time. How am I going to do this? Ain't going to happen tomorrow. But I got a plan. We're sitting in a country that's free and we can worship God because somebody had a plan. They heard from the Lord and they struck out to do something that was fantastic, but they had a plan and every day they worked that plan. I'm telling you, hope, hope. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and being convinced and confident of what you can't see. Stand your feet with me tonight, today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am persuaded that he's able to keep me. I am persuaded that these present afflictions are light and endurable. I believe that you will change your family. I believe that you will change your community. I believe that you will have to come up with a plan to do it. I believe that God's going to help you get that plan together. And I want to see you work your plan. I want you to plant a tree for somebody who's going to appreciate it that, and you're not. I want you to invest in what God, well, I'm expecting the Lord to come back any day. Well, he could, and it looks like he is. But guess what? When I was a teenager, I thought he was going to get here before I was able to get my driver's license. That's how strong we preach to come to the Lord. But guess what? I'm 40 years old. He ain't back yet. I knew people in the 70s when the late great planet Earth was a big book, and we were just quaking in our boots thinking the Lord was coming back. I believe that. Our pastor's preaching a series on Bible prophecy. I believe it, folks. I believe he could come any moment. And I'm filled with anticipation. But the question I'm asking you, until he gets here, what are we going to do? Until he gets here. When the Lord comes back, may he find us busy. May he find us preparing. Because it's his kingdom that it's about. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Glory. I don't know about you, but I'm ready. Are you ready? I want to do this as I close the service. I want to let you go. I, I think it stopped raining. But I just want to say this to you. Fathers, what do you say, all of us young fathers? How many of you are fathers? You have young children. You got young children. Hold your hand up. What do you say we try this thing? You're going a little, I really am trying it. But, but do you have a plan? Do you have a plan? Are you working the plan? What do you say we try to raise up some D.L. Moody's in our house? What do you say we raise up some godly lawyers in our house? What do you say we raise up some godly doctors in our house? What do you say we raise up some godly factory workers in our house? Lord, God knows we need some godly newspaper people. Oh, God. What do you say that this church bind together in this thought process? Until you get back, Lord, we're going to take this city. What is our future? When Pastor Kirkpatrick gets back next week, I can guarantee you one thing. He's going to be full of vision. He's going to be full of fire. He's got a chance to rest. What do you say we hear what he has to say? And as a body, we get behind it and go after it. What do you say that we, instead of, I'm, I'm, I'm saying something real strong as we close this, but I'm concerned. I really am. Many of you came as a result of revival in this church. And it's been wonderful. I did too. I came and revival kind of ran over me. I didn't come because of it. It just kind of, I came and here it came and we are, there we go. <laughs> But many of you, here's what the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Many of you are in a place of in-between right now. You're in a place of, I don't know what to do. And you're having thoughts. You're having thoughts. And, you, and you're thinking, well, I, I don't know whether to go here or to go there. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm wondering if this new wave is going to come in, a revival. And your feet are like, like off the floor going, what am I going to do? Let me explain something to you. What do you say we commit to see which part of the kingdom of God we can fit into right where we are right now. And if God chooses to move us somewhere, then that's fine. But instead of sitting here, hear me, BRSM students. All you guys I ever hear you say is, I'm seeking the will of God for my life. Well, do it and quit seeking it. What is the will of God? That you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. 
and that you have a plan that you're going to win those that are next to you for Jesus and you're going to be a worshiper. What are you going to do? I got a plan. Quit sitting in a parked car and asking God to come by with a supernatural wind of the revival or spirit or whatever and move you on to the next thing. But rather, grab a hold of this because here's what I'm concerned about. I don't want to see your hope deferred. I don't want to see your hope deferred. I want to see it put in the trust of Christ that guess what? We're part of a big thing here. And I'm going to work it as hard as I can until God says, out of here. Or the rapture comes and he says, out of here. But I guarantee you, wherever I land, I'm going to be working still. Aren't you? Yeah. Hallelujah. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would cause the fathers and the mothers in this house. Lord, teach us. You're the heavenly Father. Teach us to be fathers to our kids. Father, teach us. Lord, we don't want to just lay plans that we just, by accident and default, just go, well, I need a plan, so let me write one down. But Lord, during our time of seeking you this week in prayer, Lord, will you begin to give us a plan? And Lord, let us work it, because we want to be found busy. Lord, we don't want to be like the one who went and dug and hid his talent. Lord, we want to be like the one that doubled and tripled because we were out about doing the business of the Father. Jesus, you gave us the example at 12. You were already in the temple teaching. And Lord, you said you had to be out about your Father's business. You're setting a pattern for us, Father. And Lord, that's what we want to do. And Father, I ask, Lord, these sweet folks at this church, God, that love you so much that you would begin to give them plans. God, plans. And our pastor, Brother Kilpatrick, and our pastor, Randy Feldshaw, Lord, give our leadership in this church plans. God, that we can all jump in behind and that we can support. God, we know they're men of vision, but Lord, let us stand behind them and let us work until you come. And Father, let us see your glory and your kingdom. Oh, God, because we commit one thing to you, is that until you come, we're going to be worshiping, loving, and honoring you in the name of Jesus. Now, just lift your hands and praise him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor Ren. Amen. Don't you appreciate Brother Lando? God bless him. Amen. If you're a first-time guest this morning, we'd love to meet you. Our pastoral staff would like to meet you down in the altar area, so we'd like to welcome you here today. So if you would, first-time guests, please move forward. Uh, Brownsville, God bless you. Have a great holiday weekend. Enjoy the Labor Day. Turn around and shake somebody's hand, hug somebody's neck. God bless you today. We love you. We appreciate you. First-time guests, please move forward. The pastoral staff would love to meet you today. God bless you. Be careful on Labor Day. Have a great, a great time.